Hey, it's the last Pacifier D Fanatic upset and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections and my guest for this one is going to be Larson, the mid laner of Rogue. Now, one thing I always make a point of at the beginning of these interviews is I don't really do like the true origin story. No one cares if you played Mario as a little kid or you, you know, you like looked up to expect. No one gives a shit about that, right? But what people do care about, I will say, is how did you essentially become good is the real first question in most of these interviews, right? And when I looked at your history, Larson, what's weird is because of the timeline of when you came in. So like realistically, the first time I heard it, it was like in 2018, fully enough, because you played Frogger in that EU Masters when they were on that origin team. Everyone remembers the glorious one, blah, 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 with all the mixed team. But I noticed you actually played for years before that. In fact, as far as I can tell, you were actually playing competitive when you were 15 years old. Is this, is this accurate? Yeah. Were you just yeah, always playing? Yeah, I was always playing. I mean, I, I don't know. I always wanted to get into the pro scene, but there was like a restriction for like 16 years old for like all the leagues, basically. Right. Uh, but luckily, the UK League had it like, so you, when it turned 16, as long, as long as it turned 16, like during the split, they were fine. So I could like start my, my, my uh, career when I was 15, yeah. Oh, okay. Because that's the other thing. I was thinking because of the timeline of when you came into LEC, like, did he you know, just start or something? Like, why wasn't he with the previous group of people? Because basically, like I say, it wasn't really until 2018 you started to get like some legit fame, etc. Like in the other time, you were in just the tier two and tier threes, right? I saw you were yeah. playing with all the same people just years and years. I mean, the thing is, like, uh, my career got very delayed, I would say, because uh, I had school and in the Spanish and French league, which was the biggest leagues, and even German League, I think. Uh, they were like by far the biggest leagues. But I was like chilling in Nordic League and in UK League. Yes, because, sure. uh, I, I needed to go to school or like I wanted to go to school. I didn't want to quit school to go to uh, fucking like uh, National League team. Uh, it wouldn't make sense, I think. It would be, just be straight up stupid. Uh, for me, for, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, and give, me, people, give me your take on that do one. It. A lot of here's people a, do it. Which yeah, I here's the question. But, uh, the question I have is this. Normally in these interviews, dude, it's the other way around. They're always like, well, I knew I was really good at games, so I quit school, etc. Like, I even know people, by the way, even some Swedes who were in Counter-Strike who got really good, so they just quit their school when they were 15. And some of them, the joke is, some of them try to go back like seven years later to do the last year or whatever, which I can't even imagine what that's like going in with 15-year-olds. But what, why, why stay in school then? Why not gamble on esports? I mean, going to like Spain or something, we like, I don't know, what, what do we get salary? Like two kids? A year, uh, I mean, took a month or something. I don't know, it just didn't seem like uh, worth it. I, I, don't know, I felt like there was emotions anyway, and the emotions was like before the most important uh, way to show yourself, and it still is. Sure. It's like as long as I perform the emotions with my team, then everything will be good. And uh, I mean, 2018, I was like insanely lucky. I, I played in Yuki scene with Carol, um, and he was my younger, and we came like fourth place. We missed out in the Masters when we were like supposed to like stomp everyone. But then, luckily, Nip picked us up. Uh, picked us up, and uh, I think this like EMO was very big for my career, and the next one as well. Does that imply, by the way, obviously it could be a coincidence, uh, in, in the sense that like you were smart, you stayed in school, like you did the right thing, then you waited for the time when it was appropriate. Obviously, people are going to think like a meme. That's kind of like your play style. You're like a you're like a conservative guy who looks for the right angle. The numbers have got to make sense. Like, is that who you are? Are you a person outside the server too? Yeah, I think I use my brain a bit too much sometimes. Uh, sure. Okay. Probably go, probably go with my in, uh, my my heart a bit more, uh, but yeah, I mean for sure. Uh, I think your personality actually reflects a lot on your playstyle as well. Like I've been thinking about this. Like if I if I talk with someone, I feel like I can already look at know his playstyle honestly, just from like the conversation. Yeah, I have a, I have a similar philosophy because I wanted to ask a question. I'm obviously I was going to get to some of this later. We will, but as a to to kind of preview it along those lines, I want to ask you that actually. When you said there, you said, you didn't say like yeah, I'm like a quite smart guy. You said I sometimes overthink things. And what's funny is that's actually something. By the way, when we get to the topic later of like what happens in pressure situations, believe it or not, this is a really misunderstood detail. People think if you choke or you have a bad game under pressure. Believe it or not, that's not actually that that guy's an idiot. I've actually found in esports, by the way, when star players have moments like that, they tend to be people who get in their own head, like they think too much, or in the in the moment they like actually double think about what they should do, or they and they second guess their moves and stuff. Is there some of that? To, has that affected you? Would you say? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think in recent years, when I started playing more, uh, it like disappeared more. Like I realized uh, what the mentality should be, and I shouldn't like care too much. Uh, because at the start of my career, I scared away too much. Like, if you care too much, it's actually very bad, I think. Uh, like, if you think about League and do everything about League and, I don't know, your whole life is only about League, I think it's, at least for for me, it's not good because then I will care too much and it will probably lead to choking, uh, which is just, yeah, always not good.
No, I get what you mean by that, because if, if a fan doesn't understand, like, even though it might sound weird, because you think, surely the game should matter the most. No, that's exactly the problem. I mean, I, my analogy, dude, would be like if you were playing poker or something. If you have loads of chips in front of you, but you re- th- keep thinking that that's real money, and you're thinking, oh, that could be like a house or a car, you're never going to go in on a fucking bet, you know? You're going to go, you're going to play super conservative. Whereas the guys, like, I mean, it's not a great example right now, but luckily this interview will last for years. I would say that's basically what people like about Humanoid, mate. He just seems like he doesn't give a fuck, doesn't he? He just seems like yeah. win or loss, he just does whatever he wants every game doesn't he <laughs> yeah yeah I, I agree i mean it seems like he doesn't give too much fucks so but that's like uh, yeah i mean it goes it, uh, both ways it can be yes it indeed. can uh, yeah, i mean as you can see now it can exactly sure and that's what i always feel like uh, I, I could go also go with mentality i don't give a fuck but uh sometimes when uh, i i sometimes try like this mentality in lc games and sometimes it goes great and sometimes it just goes to like shit uh so I kind of stopped d- doing that, and I try to take it serious every time, like 100%. Like, like, yeah. I mean, I know at this point, like how how I want to perform and how I perform. So, but yeah. Right. As you mentioned already, I was definitely going to get into this. Don't worry. One of the bizarre things about your career is you literally did play with Cadrell as your jungler on two different levels, technically. Uh, so what different. I want to know is that, right, is this is actually also, if people don't know, this is obviously after Cadrell was a mid laner in a ULCS. Like, he obviously role swapped, if people don't know, and became a jungler. And that's actually, funnily enough, where he got to show off, like, on streams and stuff, all his game knowledge, and he had good pathing and stuff, right? Is it as simple as, because I always thought the reason why, famously, you have all these amazing support players that role swapped from ADC is because obviously Obviously, the simple theory is he should have an idea of what an ADC wants, right? Was that the case with Cadrell? Since he used to be a mid laner, did he have like a good sense of what like the mid laner should want? Uh, wait, what the mid laner should want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess so. Yeah, he was a good dog, I think. Good dog, like he, he was not stupid. Uh, was he like yeah, a shot caller and stuff? Nah, not really. I mean, I think it's when I played the film, it was like start of when uh, like he start of the rules up, so he was trying to focus on himself, and... right. Uh, it's also like sometimes we play against Mjallnus that would uh, play to like stompy angle and then it would be hard for him. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was a start of carry, so I can't really judge his start of a younger carry because it's not start. Fair enough. It's, uh, I don't know. He has so much to think about when you become uh, like a new younger. Is it weird seeing him like the expert on like LEC and all stuff now and like the fact that he used to just be your jungler? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, really cool for him. Like, uh, so cool. Like, uh, how big he is, but I mean, I'm not surprised. Like, he was all super funny. Uh, I mean, I've known him for a very long time. Uh, I was playing like PUBG with him in like 2017 and stuff as well. So, he's a good friend. So, oh, mate, I'm almost convinced at this point in time. Bearing in mind, you obviously have the, the Swedish accent. You're one of the people who just ruined his accent because you know he's got like the UK flag. And then when I met him, I'm like, bro, are you from Sweden? So why are you talking that way? Because he does like the he, he, all, he really rounds off the words. It's just, it just sounds so Swedish, mate. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe me and Exa Smiley. Here's the thing. You've also got another weird connection to the modern day, which is like, what? Which is, if people don't know, another of your junglers and later coach is the guy who's the Misfits coach right now. Now, he's changed his name now to Coach Carter, but if you know, he's oh, yeah, Handy yeah. Floss, right? So yeah. it must be, who was he back in the day? Who was he? Who was Kenny? Yeah, who was he? Who was he before this period when he was playing with you? Uh, well, he was a bit of an itchy, itchy boy. Okay. Uh, uh... I remember we had some issues with him and uh, Hado, if you know Hado. Sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I didn't play with him too much either. Like, it was just a uh, uh, short split. But, I mean, he's okay. a very, very nice guy. I, think. I, don't, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know him that well. But, oh, fair enough. Okay. Let's get into I, it I remember then. he was, like, very active on Twitter, like, making funny stuff. Okay, I might, I have to, might have to dig into that see if there's something naughty there right here's the thing let's get into it because as we, as you say basically EU Masters is where you started to get a little bit of get known etc like obviously there was the period when as you say you were in the NIP squad right as I said the funny the re- if people don't know for real the way that EU Masters became super famous was that they got lucky that that origin super team of all those really famous players from like Insect from Korea and all these like e- le- e- European legends just came and joined it and it made everyone watch it and then when we watched it the funny thing was it almost worked like a preview for the next two years of League of Legends because you look who Frog and plays in all the matches and he's playing like you like Nemesis like it's all the guys we now know so when you played against this team the origin team right if people don't know that had like a really weird setup where they weren't like a real team in fact as far as I know they they formed like days before the actual event and if you watch they actually started off kind of a bit whack in the groups and they sort of got better and better as the tournament went on right by the time you played them you played them in the quarterfinals were they actually really good no 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 it should, it should have been easily 2-0 oh okay um, I still used to joke about this with Finn but in uh, in game one we were like 10k gold ahead uh, but then like Finn got caught out and they got Nash 
and then they had we had like uh, they had three nips down as well on top of that. We had three nips down from a region, so it like the game was over. Right? Like they had three nips down, Nash was up, but then some I think got caught. I remember, and they got Nash, and then I stole the three nips, and then we lost the game, and then we stomped them. Then the game after that, so I mean, in theory, it should have been a two, right? In theory, uh, and then they went on to smash everyone else. So that was kind of depressing to see because it was right. like, like, should have been you, right? Like, I, I mean, it should have been us, yeah. Sure. I mean, it was very hype as well, like to beat beat these guys. Like, who was it? Frog and Insect. Forgiven. It was oh, a pretty good yeah. lineup of players, yeah. yeah. It was some bangers, yeah. yeah was Frogan actually any good at this time? Obviously, when he'd come back from having like a period of time off when he got didn't get picked up by Echo Fox or whatever. Was he any good at this time? He was solid. I don't know. It was not like hard to, too hard to play against him, but he, he, was, he was not bad. Yeah. Okay. Right, after this, obviously, the main point of contention that we want to talk about is when you came, for the most brief period possible, to the EULCS. If people don't know the story, you came when it was that summer split of the dreaded H2K that was a pretty bad team, obviously. And they just put you in one week for two games. I'm assuming you, like, stood in or something for selfie. Or... What was the logic? Were you actually being brought in the team? Like, were you told anything? Like, if you come in the team, you do well, you can stay. Was it just like you're only uh, standing in for a week? What was the logic? I it was only uh, standing in for like a week. I just came like there on a the first day, and then I played a week, and then I left again. Uh, we actually did well. We I remember like we beat Splice. We like on top of standings, kind of. So uh, actually, that that one was very big as well for me. I think this was also a big moment for me when when I went into LCS and I did well because uh, that got people's eye a bit more for me. And then on top after that, your masters came up where we went to finals with Nip, and then it was just like. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this was very big for me, yeah, for sure. Like, this H2K into the Masters was, like, the biggest point for me to reach uh, LSE, I think. Because here's the funny thing. If you remember the next year when Leader famously came in for Misfits in similar circumstances, because famously, like, he did the first game and it took him a few to have a good game. That actually, I think, set him back a few years. I wanted to ask you, why did it take you so long? Like, when I look at these games, dude, first games against G2, who, spoiler, remember, like, this is, like, still one of the best teams in the world. And then the second game, like you said, against Spice, who was actually, like, the third or fourth best team, if people remember, you were smurfing. You were, like, a Zay, crushing them just like you do now. Like, why, yeah. why, did, why didn't you sort of get picked up earlier to an LEC team? I kind of got picked up in, I mean, this was 2018 summer split, right? And uh, I was in LEC 2019 and in spring split, I could have been in LEC, but I chose to finish school like the stupid boy I am. Oh, that's why they had you in the academy squad instead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, okay. That was the part I wondered about because I never understood. Like, look, no offense against who was it? It was the guy from Misfits. What was the game player? Yeah. There you go. Senko. He was an all right player, but this is a period of time when he was on sort of a down year. I expected you wouldn't get put in because that was basically my question. When they talk about that class of three players, where it was Nemesis, Abidagi, Human, you know the stories have been told a million times. So why weren't you in that mix? Why wasn't, why wasn't Larson the fourth name? Yeah, I mean, I would say it was very lucky that I didn't uh, join uh, the main team in Spring Split because we all remember the famous Rogue Spring Split team. Yes. That would be an awful start of my career. So thank God I didn't play for that. Uh, now we could be saviors of Rogue instead, which was great. Uh, I mean, the academy team was like way better than the main team. So I was very lucky that I didn't come in with uh, these other mid laners. Uh, sure. As you said, when you were in NIP, you also did make the finals of any U Masters and the one where you played against the infamous Mad Lions, but we're talking about the one that was the lineup that made the ball get into the LCS, self-made and crown shot and nemesis. What was this final like? Were, you, were they the better team? I, by the way, did they, were they actually as good as they were hyped to be? Because obviously they were hyped as like the ultimate fucking ERL team or whatever. Uh, they, were, they were very good. Yeah. They were very good. I mean, people were saying at the time that they could like win against LEC teams. Like yeah, yeah. Them, which is probably true, I think. Probably true. Uh... I remember, I mean, I don't know. The thing is, you can look very good, but then on stage, like, everything can change. And in the semifinals at the Masters, they, like, were so close to getting knocked out against, like, ESG, which were annoyed for you, and Breaky, and the Lads. Like, they're just a streamer team. They, they were, I remember they were, like, 5k gold behind, and they will be knocked out if they didn't throw out Baron uh, ESG. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like on stage, anything can happen always. But they, they were very good, yeah. They Did you play well in this final? Uh... I mean, at that point, I was not too smart about the game. Like, I was a rookie, so I was uh, not smart enough. I think I played mechanically fine, but I was not smart enough to, like, uh, help my team like, win win against them because they were just way better. So uh, I, did, I did fine, I think. I think it's special. Okay. So as you say, eventually, especially because of the spring split of Rogue, it was just a terrible team. If people don't know, the bizarre thing is, the two teams at the time everyone used to make fun of was Rogue and Excel, obviously, like, this split with yeah. the top of the league. Like, that's how things turn around, isn't it? So uh, not, when you came in... Not. Well, not like this moment, sure. When you came in, though, one of the things I think people really forget about is that first summer split, dude. Because the thing people forget is this. 
Rogue already like looked had some like good results like in the middle of the split. It was like that start looked decent, but nobody expected that you would actually make this run in the playoffs. Like you were supposed to be a team that was like fifth to six. You locked at that. Like the top four was set. Remember, it was supposed to be like G two Fnatic, uh, Splice, and Vitality. I think it was the four teams if you remember. This was a big up. Like essentially, people don't know one of your first big playoff runs in LEC was a big upset, right? Yeah, um, this is actually the happiest I've been after a win. I think like after this place win, I think still to this day, if it. Not, not like hasn't changed in like the past year or something. It's the second fastest series of EU all time. Oh, like, okay. Of EU LCS, LEC all time. I think it's the second fastest after like G2 against the region in Spring Split that same year. Nothing changed, but I remember this, this, this was second fastest series of all time, which was like insane red because we were supposed to get stomped by Spice. So that, that was like complete adrenaline kick. And then I don't think people forgot about the split because uh, the infamous Corky package happened uh, okay. a week after that. So sure. yeah, I think people are well aware of what happened. They might remember that part, certainly. I don't think they remember the beating spice part, necessarily. Yeah, maybe not. Was there some sort of, like, I remember, because this is actually a deal people might not know. At the time I was doing my talk show with Veteran, I actually remember, I'm not joking, I'm almost certain he actually predicted your team would win that match. Like, I think he had some stylistic reasons to why. Like, was <laughs> did you guys have a favourable matchup against Spice? Did the coach come up with something good? How did he win? Uh, for, uh, what, what everyone said at the time was the opposite. I think that we were not favourable against Spice because we had the same playstyle as them and they oh, okay. were better, better at this playstyle. That was the narrative that was going on, I remember. We had an extremely good momentum that playoffs until the Corky package, sadly. So, uh, yeah. Because we were about to beat Chuck as well. We were 2-1 up if the Corky package didn't happen. And we, had, like, we were playing like insanely well. We were like in complete uh, in the zone. Like sometimes you're just in the zone and everything is, I don't know, you just see everything and that was one of those. Because the weird thing to me, mate, is if people don't know, the next year, there was a bunch of roster moves. Like, in came the bot lane, in came Vander and Hans Sama. Basically, uh, the whole Vander team was comes in along. It Vander was in it. Only Hans changed. Uh, changed. Sure, I mean, I'm, uh, oh yeah, you're right, actually. Vander was playing in that split. Yeah, oh, he was already in the main team, actually. Yes, yeah. that's true. But basically, uh, everyone in, in the team from the 2021, except, obviously, Finn was the top laner still. You hadn't had Otto Amnit at this point in time. If people don't remember, I remember coming into 2020 because of the good summer split, and then these look like upgrades at position. A lot of people actually thought your team could be a contender, but in the spring, I remember everyone being like, ah, summer was just a fluke, like they dropped off, like they're not that good. What happened in the spring, do you think? Right in the spring 2020? Yeah. Oh, I mean, COVID hit and we lost everything. I think we were looking very promising. Uh, oh, you think COVID... going online was what, what affected you? I mean, we lost every online game until playoffs. We lost like four straight. Right. We were like in a really good spot, really, really good spot. I remember we had like nine wins, five losses, something like this. And then COVID hit and it was like one week break and we were just like chilling. I don't know. We were like uh, kind of confused with what was going on. Uh, and then we went online and we lost every single game, uh, four games in a row. And I don't know, we, uh, we lost so much. Uh, I don't know what happened, actually. But we lost a lot during that COVID time. The start. It makes sense there was another fact thing. So I was going to say, if people don't remember, this was the period when actually you could just do like all scaling comps all the time and everyone was complaining about Origin and all those things. Like, I would have thought this would be a great time for Rogue. Not really. I don't know. I think the Spring Split was not too much scaling. I remember the Summer Split where like Asir, Aphelios, Orn, like the, the Rogue peak times when we became good. But Spring Split was not really scaling, I think. It was... Uh, a bit of Fiesta, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay. What do you think actually changed for some of them? Uh, we changed a lot of things, like in the team, with how we like uh, practice, uh, like way more structure in the practice, way, way more. Because uh, I remember, because like, G2 were the best team, like 2019, 2020, so everyone were thinking like, yeah, they're just having so much fun, we should also have fun, yes, just like be loose and crazy like them. Uh, but obviously, that's not how things work. Uh, so we're like trying to take... Uh, take the, the inspiration from them but during the, for the summer split we like we completely changed it and became like extremely structured which made us good as you could see in summer split uh without this we want to become good i think so yeah we structured everything way more and just let go of this g2 fear of like only having fun basically this was the period as well if people remember where for the first time in the regulars but you were first place and you won all those crazy games and obviously the kind yeah. of record that's continued since was in the regular season were you the best team uh, I mean, we still got like stomped against G2 both games, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, which we always do in regular season against G2, we always get stomped by them. Uh, do you think you had a mental block against them? It's obviously the easy now. I, I, think we had mental, I think at that point we had mental block against the strong teams, yeah. Uh, right. For sure. For sure, we had mental block. Our mentality was pretty bad, I feel like, going against the strong teams. Because obviously this was the period, if people don't know, where, I mean, funny, people tried to make this narrative years later, but obviously the team changed year on year. This was the year where Rogue was the scaling team, right? Yep. Yeah, definitely. Very scaling, very scaling. Only scaling. Did you like that style of play? 
Uh, I mean, as long as you have a playstyle, uh, I'm happy, basically. I mean, as long as you know what you want to do in the game, how you want to play the game. Uh, this was, I think this was very, very good there yeah, for us because we just found a place that worked for us and we all committed to it and we just, yeah, we, yeah, we all knew what to do in the game. And I think it's 2021, we also had like a playstyle, very clear playstyle uh, of playing a lot through Jungler and Jungler getting ahead uh, or, or bot lane uh, snowballing. So I think it's very important to have a playstyle at least. Sure. Right. In these playoffs, there's an angle that I want to ask you about, which is obviously one of the first moments where people started just saying Rogarel chokers, blah, blah. Was this first match? Because you played against Fnatic. And if people don't remember, this was mm, the split yeah. where Fnatic barely made the playoffs. And everyone was like, ooh, maybe, they like, maybe they're not that good. Maybe they don't go to Worlds. And then obviously they, they smashed you in this game, right? But this does Yeah, I mean, the, the narrative showcase is coming from this. Playoffs doesn't really make sense. Okay. I mean... We got stomped by Fnatic, but our meta read was like so insanely bad. Like our meta read was like completely out of it. They were playing like Luce and Evelyn. I remember this was like so OP, but we had no clue about it, for example. Uh, and then we picked up on it, and it was like turbo broken. So our meta read into coming coming to Fnatic was like so bad. And then we changed it, and we freed Mad. I remember, and Mad were like the big contenders, if I remember during the yeah, yeah. summer split. They yep. were like we were one game ahead of them, I think, in the standings at the end of it. Yep. And they were like freed Mad. So. I mean, if you're 3-0 mad, who is like one game behind your standings, I think it's solid. And then we lost 3-2 against G2. It went to game five, I remember. So, uh, I mean, I don't think this playoff is like as bad as people make out to be. I think it was a pretty decent playoff, like 3 0 mad and taking G2 five games. No, I'm with you, mate. It's just the problem is people remember that first match when you were the number one seed. I want to ask you something, though, because you referenced it there. The reason it's actually cool, though, dude, this is like an anime storyline. Now people know Lucian is one of your, like, pocket picks. You're actually mega on it. You've played it all over the place. But the joke is, if people don't know, you had never played it mid at the time. This was actually when Nemesis played it against you, when it, you, you you got beat by it, and then you picked it up immediately in that playoffs and started to become one of your champions, right? Yeah, surprisingly, uh, not a mage became a champ. Was very surprising. What's the, what is the deal with that, by the way? Because obviously you have... If I go look at your most games played, it's going to be all the classic mages, but then it's just but, like but, Akali. But you know, that's for every player, right? For If you look at every player, besides like sure. leader, maybe. Sure. I mean, obviously I play uh, a lot of mages, right? But they're also very strong. And uh, I mean, they fit me well, right? But uh, it's also been like the meta for a very long time. If I think if you look at Caps, like his top five is probably like four mages, I, I would bet, something like this. Sure, but as I say, that's just because how the battle was. The difference is that yeah, he's going to have exactly. a fuck ton more Silas games and fucking, you know, yeah, course, probably course. even has more Akali games than you, if I had to guess. I have a lot of Akali, though, but... You have yeah. quite a few. Why yeah. is that one champion seem to, like, stand out of your champion pool from the normal patterns? Why do you like that one? Because it has been broken, so... Yeah. <laughs> just broken? I, okay. It was very broken for a long time, like, very long time, so... I don't know. I mean, I would play whatever is meta, right? Like, last year, Luz on TF was really strong, and I played them a lot, uh, but yeah, I mean, if there, if there's like a uh, assassin or something like this that's not meta, I'm likely to not play it, right? That's like... Uh, okay. That's that's true. Now, when you went to Worlds, even though obviously Mad Lions took a lot of the flack because they didn't even fucking get to the main event, that helped. But the problem is in your group, which lets me real, was a fucking hard group. and two of the best teams in the world. I don't think it? it was that hard, but yeah. Was it? Why not? I think GDD were like very overrated. Uh I mean, that's all well and good if you fucking lose to them every time. Like, what do you say that for? Surely your team's dog shit then? Yeah, we're a dog shit, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, fair enough then, okay. I think if we're not dog shit, we could have beaten them. Because uh, they were like, I think they were like, yes, fine. They were like a good team, like not more. Down were obviously insane, but EGG, they were like, I remember people were hyping us so much, but I felt like when I was watching them, and I remember I scrimmed, actually scrimmed against them before the draw. Right. And they didn't feel like that, that insane. Uh I think the most of the hype from the community, uh, but we were like extremely dog shit, so they still beat us. So, what would how would you describe this first experience at Worlds? Absolutely horrible. It was like one of the worst experiences for my life, I think. Because we started off, I mean, it was in China and COVID just started, so we were like insane quarantine for two for two weeks yeah. in a, in a room without seeing anyone, and we already as, as, as a team we lost our minds in this in this. Uh, oh sadly. right, I see. Sadly, okay. we kind of boomed already in this uh, quarantine. The environment became very bad. Uh, and this has kept going for the whole world. So our team culture environment was very bad for this world. Very bad. So it was uh, not, not, not a good experience. Even if maybe not for this world, do you think you were, were you able to like learn anything from the scrims against the good teams and the Asian yeah, teams? Yeah, I mean, stuff? what we learned was uh, the younger mid players that basically were like, you played for younger a lot. And 
this is something that we always uh, like in spring speed the year after that we showed us very clearly like this play style yeah, and, yeah. and how we we're playing so we still uh, learned a lot yeah uh, even though it was uh, not a fun uh, experience yeah, this is something I want to ask about because one thing I've actually found quite cool about Rogue, despite the fact you haven't won the title yet, is you, you've seen this significant transformation of the style of play each year. And so as people would have said, like, here's the difference. Back then, especially teams that did like scaling, everyone would obviously just be like, oh, just boring, you're just going to do that forever. As you said, immediately in the spring split, you guys came out and you had a, one of the best early games in the whole league. You actually winning all the games that way. So like, was this a conscious decision? Like, we're going to change our style of play? Uh... Uh, I think the meta was actually. I'm not sure. The meta was not that much from a younger. I don't know. It was kind of. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It just happened naturally. I think off the world. Like it just happened. Uh, and Spy just wanted to play like this, and uh, uh, I don't know. I don't remember. Like I had some conversation. Like this is how we should play the game, or like whatever. Uh, just kind of happened. I think it was kind of the meta, and this kind of hurt us. I remember coming to playoffs uh, this this same year because a lot of the farming youngers got nerfed. And I think the camps XP got nerfed actually. I think camp XP got nerfed, and we were still in the same mindset, uh, and we didn't like adapt to like. I remember like Volibear showed up a lot. We didn't really adapt to the to how the meta changed. I think, uh, yeah. I remember we yeah we got stomped like the first series against Mad. I remember in that playoffs as well. Was this a time period? Because obviously Inspired was literally like MVP candidate all these splits. He eventually did win the MVP. Now he's over in America. He looks fucking amazing over there. Unsurprisingly, the whole team plays his style there as well. Like I know he, he seems to have like, is he a guy who's like a vocal leader? Is a shot caller? Is he just a guy whose style of play makes people play that way? It seems like, look, even if people can criticize elements of his play, he clearly knows how he wants to play. And it seems like yeah. his team's fit to him. Right? I mean, he makes, he, he knows how he wants to play and he makes his team play, play how he wants to play. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's very good to have a play style, as I said. So, I mean, it's good by him to ma make his team, like, play like he wants. And as long as it's a good way to play the game, uh, which it uh, seems like it's working very well for EG. So. One thing I try to be very careful with is, like, just because your team didn't win the LEC, it's not like it was a bad team. As we're talking about, you had all these splits where you're first, you're getting top four every time. But when people look back now, obviously people criticised at the time when he left and Malran came and everyone's like, oh, it was Inspired's fault. Like, here's the question. To me, Inspired's obviously a good jungler. You can see how you're right. Larson's obviously a good mid laner. But were you that, were you, did you actually work well together? How do, you, how do you think the combo of the jungle mid was? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think we worked well. Uh, obviously we struggled sometimes uh, well, because the whole team struggled uh, but I think uh, I mean I was like 2020 summer split we played basically my style uh, we was like I was playing Oriana Siri and he was basically playing for like uh, he was a bit of a dog angler uh, and then then we changed to, to playing his style and uh, I mean I, tra adapt, I adapted a lot uh, playing like the Lux and TF and it's adapted to him so I think we're working well uh, and I mean yeah I mean we won regular season both Bits, I think, and I think we're working well, uh, but I mean, we didn't win the title yet, so yeah. Even though now, because G2 didn't end up winning any titles that year and didn't even go to Worlds, now it doesn't seem that sexy. But at the time when you beat them in that low bracket match, first yeah. of all, because of the summer one, and then because of the fact that, dude, loads of people on those talk shows were picking them to win the low bracket to win the yeah, Worlds. And also, also that must have been a big deal, right? Yeah, it was a very big deal. And also, like, stomped us in every single uh, best of one, I think. At that point, I'm not sure if we had ever won a best of one against G2. I think not. I think we have I never won a yeah. game against G2. Only like in the best of five in the split before that, we won some games. So they were stomping us in every every like every like game. So that was like a huge deal for sure. We were like, we were very happy, I remember. Uh, but yeah. I mean, G2 was like very hyped as well during, yeah, during this sure, yeah. But they, I mean, they had the amazing it, players, let's be real. They did have, yeah, that's the other thing they, people don't. I always, I sometimes think fans don't get it, dude. It's a bit like why I'm sure a lot of LEC teams actually hope Fnatic doesn't make the playoffs. Because when you have players like that, they could just have a good day out of nowhere. They could just win the match for you, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And But the thing is, G2 had a very good spring split and they also had a very good summer split, but they like were very bad in playoffs both times. Uh, so I guess they were like the, the rogue of 2021, I think. I mean, we also had a very bad summer split playoffs. So yeah, I can't really talk. We also sure. showed out of that completely. So yeah. Right, in they were, the spring they were, they were one. Like us. They were a bit like us, G2, in that year. They were like sure. actually very good in regular season, but then they just bombed out in playoffs. Yeah, for sure. Right, obviously in the final of the spring split, you finally get to a final. In the past, you'd been like upper bracket, you'd be in the lower third match. Now you get to your first final. Do you think you were going to win this match? 
Yeah, I was very confident we win. Very confident. Uh, like after coming off, of, coming off of the beating G2, like very convincingly, we beat them as well. Uh, I really felt like we would win. Uh, yeah, yeah. How would you explain what happened in this final? Because the thing is, right, there's a lot of times, I've even said this before, people don't know. You can sometimes have three twos where it's not actually that close. Like, you know, it's only the two games you win that are close. This is one of the nightmare ones, though, dude, where you feel like you actually were in the position to just win the whole series. It goes wrong. I mean, this was a big nightmare. Like, uh, both game three and game four were, like, practically won. Like, they were won games. We had Nash in this both games, like, having huge leads. So, I mean, I think we were, like, definitely the better team, like, by far. Uh, I mean, you can't say that when you lose, but uh, I mean, we're like very ahead in these games, and I mean, I, yeah, throwing these games were very impressive. Sadly, I wanted to ask this because I want to know if specifically this one fits the pattern. Because at the time, one of the things people used to basically complain about if Rogue lost in the playoffs is it's not that you lost; it's that to them they thought it was like the team doesn't look like it's doing anything; it's just losing the game. How much of like Rogue losing was like inting? How much was just like not knowing what to do or Rogue time or whatever the fuck people used to say? How much I mean, was this that? Rogue thing? time was like the uh, huge issue of ours. I think it's probably the biggest issue. We had like kind of big issues when we were like got ahead. I think we played way too passive and we didn't like want to push our leads hard enough and we like tried to like, still play like the efficient game that we were known for but I think when we are that ahead as we got we needed to stop playing like so efficient and trying to play like three lanes and just trying to play the perfect game uh, like if you watch LPL and stuff they, they, they when they get ahead they're just like they're going at you on like two lanes and they don't overthink they just go and we were like overthinking a lot I think it was hard to play yeah I mean yeah what about, obviously, this was the year where, crucially, the key change was Otto Abney came in, who was a mega veteran, being in a bazillion teams all the time. What would you say the change of bringing him in over Finn was? Yeah, I mean, but, I mean this also helped to us, like, bringing up players direct, like, putting him on weak side, because Finn, was, Finn is not a weak side player, even though we did he did do his best to be a weak side player in 2020 summer. Uh, he was It was not easy for him, because he is not a player that uh, should like it's used to was was used to being weak side, weak side at least at the time. I think in being forced to be a lot weak side in Excel as well. Uh but his play style was not that play style, so Odo was very play weak side player, right? So it helped us a lot to like just have a play style to just like play, play for bot and just leave top like alone. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it was very big for us. Right, I wanna ask a question, right? Even though on one level, you can make esports and enough, just video games, who cares, you know, life's more important, blah, blah, blah. But to be fair, you can say the same thing about a football match or a basketball game in the NBA. But I know that if people are top competitors, it actually can affect people a lot more when you lose than people know. Like, I've heard stories about, like, NBA legends where when they lost to their rival or something, they, would, they just locked themselves away in the bedroom for, like, two weeks in the dark, just thinking about life and, you know, what I'm going to do next season. Did yeah. this, how, did, how did you take the spring file? Did you brush it off? Did it affect you? What was it like? Uh, oof. I think I, I was living in uh, denial for a very long time. I was trying to push it away because uh, it was such a hor- yeah, horrible experience, obviously, to throw through a final, like uh, get reverse swept. Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I just tried to enjoy my off season. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't try to think of it too much. I just tried to uh, yeah, learn what I could and then just forget about the reverse sweep. I know this might sound weird, but I actually genuinely think one of the cr- craziest things about the way people's careers play out when they're at like the championship level is I think sometimes the people who like choke and they've lost a bunch of semis and finals, I actually think sometimes if you look, there'll always be like one or two of them that were close. And if they'd have won one of those, it might have changed everything. Like the mentality might be different. You would think differently if you're behind or you think, well, I can beat that team. Like, Do you think there was, was there some of this? If you'd have won that particular split, do you think history is different? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't think so. At least not for our team. Uh, yeah, def- yeah, I, yeah. But for the way uh, things happened, like in summer and stuff, I don't see us winning that helping. Might even been worse. Like might even have boosted uh, egos and stuff even more. So. Oh, I see. Right. Sure. But I feel like coming into summer, we uh, had like not, we were like trying to win a lot because we just lost the final, got reverse up. So we we're like, okay, I guess we we stomp everyone. We gotta win the title. Uh, so yeah, I think it was good. I, I we played a better summer because we lost, kind of. No, I get what you mean because I mean, as you're saying, like that's another thing people I think would probably agree with. But when Rogue doesn't win the title, it looks like every split you come back in the regular split, like right, we've got to prove we're the best again. We've got to win all these BO ones so we can get back to the hype and go go to the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It definitely gives you a lot of motivation, right? When you lose a final, so. 
I've noticed that a lot of the interviews you did, you were often actually fairly humble. You would say other oh, players were better or Caps is better or something, you know, like legendary players, etc. But if you've had this many splits where you're in first place, you're winning the most games, eventually you've got to think like, maybe I'm the best. Maybe I'm supposed to win. I'm the best, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. For sure. Uh, I think it's very crazy. I haven't won it. Uh, but uh, I just need to keep working hard and improve on everything I can. And then hopefully it will come to me eventually, right? Uh, I can't do more than just doing everything I can to get a title. Uh, so, yeah. Because I actually thought in this summer split, actually, just like the previous summer split, I thought in the 2021 summer split, you played great. You could have won the MVP that split, right? Wait, which one? For summer instance, last year? I was pretty bad at the start of it. Uh, I remember. But the second half of split, I think, might have been the best league I ever played, uh, honestly. Like, even in the best of five series against Memphis, I played very well, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, I remember the times in 2020 and summer, like, Second half of split, I felt like I was playing the best I ever did. So, yeah. What about this? Obviously, in the playoffs, you've mentioned the one series that was the good one. It was the Misfits back and forth in the fifth game. Everyone remembers I mean, we were not good. We were not bullshit. good. We were not good. Like, going game okay. five to, to Misfits was very bad. Like, it was very boring already. That's for sure. Sure. That's a team we should free you if you want to win the title. So... Yeah. But obviously the problem here is while that did qualify you to Worlds, you then just got two zero, three zero twice, right? Just zero swept straight out of the out of the yeah, playoffs. I mean, this was the the worst playoffs I've ever been 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 a part of for sure. We were what not even close. We were not even close to winning against Fnatic and Mad. Like every game was a stomp. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah. How would you explain it? What happened? I mean, just big uh, and like yeah, just big team issues. Just big team issues. Uh, was very clear and yeah we couldn't fix them it was big like environment culture issues and yeah it was not it was not it was not a good environment we had during that time and uh it showed very clearly right one of the people in your team that i think it's bizarre this guy's managed to remain a mystery for this long is obviously the head coach freddy 122 even though he's the head coach he almost never does video interviews he doesn't even do like many text interviews he just seems to somehow avoid it all because yeah, i've always wanted to know because he's done a great job with the coach. I look at all the different players, all the different years, the stars of players. So what I want to ask was this, though. He obviously seems like he's a very quiet guy. I actually knew him a little bit when he was a player. He was a very quiet guy. He was the kind of guy where, like, the joke is he'd just answer exactly what you asked him. He wouldn't say it extra. He'd just, like, you know, whatever you say, he'd answer. That's it. But So I yeah. wanted to know this. What is he actually like as a coach? Like, obviously, people know coaching is about tactics and what you do with the players but you know people know the Yamatos of the world and the guys with the speech and stuff I don't, I, am I wrong I don't envision Freddie 122 as a speech guy before the beginning no, you know, definitely it's, it's not. G2 we're, guys is not come on <laughs> definitely not uh, yeah we have uh, Chris who do speeches sometimes about this week uh, Chris was uh, stuck with COVID so we had okay. Freddie doing the speech and Freddie just said uh, uh, like one word and then, then that's that's it so he's definitely <laughs> okay. not he's not doing any speeches not a Yamato canon that's for sure uh how would you describe uh, I mean, his style then? Like, if someone if someone's not super vocal, how how do they how do they push you and pull you? How do they get you to improve? Oh, well, I mean, Freddie knows how he wants to play the game, like how he sees the game. Uh, so he has tries to enforce his how what he thinks is really important to do in the game. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I know him for a lot. Like he's just trying to enforce the really important things in the game. And would you say you have a similar mentality to how League of Legends? Uh, at the start, I had a completely different. At the start, I was only thinking about scaling, like 2019. I was only only had scaling in my mind. And then I came with Freddy, who had like, he only wants winning lanes, because he's a coach, he just wants winning lanes. Uh, but then after like a year working with him, we, I kind of reached to his uh, understanding that you can't just uh, scale and hope to win. Sure. So, yeah. But uh, it's not that, it's not that extremely vocal coach. Uh, it's not... Yeah, but yeah, I've been seeing like big changes with him. I think he's way more, uh, how do you say, assertive or like more dominant now or like, uh, I don't know, alpha, <laughs> if you want to say that. Fair enough, okay. Uh, he's definitely improved on that part. Uh, and that's like, yeah, that's very good for him that he improved on this, for example. How would you explain to me what happened at the next Worlds, the last year's Worlds? Because this was the one where on paper, no one even gave you a chance to because how the playoffs went, everyone was like, right, the group of death, there's no way rogues get out because obviously it was FPX and that one, like the two best teams in the world in theory yeah, and the yeah. favourites for Worlds. But yeah. even though you didn't get out, to be fair, just like Cloud9, you put them in a pretty good spot and you had games, like obviously you would beat FPX, you had, there was, let's be, I know everyone now retcons are like, who cares? You almost beat that one. You were in a fucking nice position at one point in that game. Like these, this was suddenly a winnable group out of nowhere, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with Worlds and like all, all stage games basically, like, 
all the even if you get stomped every game against Asian team in scrims, like then you go to stage and then it's suddenly like winnable. Uh, like when you play Asian teams in scrims, they're like so insanely aggressive, especially Korean teams, and you just it's so hard to play. But then you go. I've heard they just like skill checking you all the yeah, time. Yeah, like, mad I mean, Korean, way, right? teams, <laughs> Korean teams are like disgusting. I can't believe the way they play scrims. Like it's the opposite of how they play on stage. On stage, you're like not skill checking; they're just playing their macro gameplay a lot. Uh, but about the screens, they're doing the complete opposite. They're only skill checking, and it's so hard to play against them. But yeah, I mean, then you go on stage and, you, you, and every game feels winnable, honestly. Like even against Dalman, as you said, it was very winnable uh, until some very big ends. Uh, even if yeah. you didn't get out of this group, as I said, it's not like you were supposed to with the expectations in this one. It's pretty cool to be win a game off FPX, though. It was, they were contel- oh, probably one, the one team in the world. We ran 2 1 against FPX. Oh, that's right. So yeah, yeah. It was not uh, expected. Uh, Obviously, they were quite bad somehow. Even though we were hearing that when we were screaming, we we're hearing that FPX is like oh, they're so good guys. Oh, okay. And we were, we were like a bit scared. We we're like, oh shit, they're stomping everyone. But then, I mean, then it they just ended up having booming as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that yeah, was not too terrible. But we lost against NA team, so it was kind of embarrassing as well. It was like cool that we beat FPX twice, but we also lost against NA two times. Yeah, we lost against NA two times, so it was also a bit embarrassing. I just wouldn't say it was any. I'd just say I lost against Perks. It sounds better that way. You don't have to say what team, you know. You just make it, what was it, G2? Yeah, never mind. It's just Perks, don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, that Perks is fan, right? So, yeah. True. <laughs> Not too shabby. Right, what about this then? Because obviously, like I referred to earlier, when we come to the 2022 year, this year now, this is the time period where actually, even though obviously we're going to keep talking about being in position to win and all of it, this is where people have got to start being honest about what they say in the off season and how their opinion changes. Because, dude, nobody liked these off season moves outside of Rogue. Everyone thought, right, when Spired's gone, so the team's fucked. What, Hans Sama's leaving as well? Oh, there's no way this team. Like, if people don't know, Comp had been around. I mean, he used to actually be a very good ERL player, but because he'd yeah. been in shitty vitality, no one gave a fuck about him. Obviously, no one really knew Malrang. He was just some weird jungler from the LCK briefly. So, like, on paper, this was never supposed to be like, the best team in the LE. What did you actually think when you got these players? Like, what was the story even like, dude? If someone comes to you, like, yeah, inspired going it's good you gotta get a bit worried right <laughs> i mean of course i was very worried and i think everyone was very worried uh like inspired house leaving that's uh, two very big players uh and then uh game comp and malware were very i mean i come i came into split knowing that this would be a huge flip uh, uh i mean i i mean I, I was studying a lot of players in off season and malware and comp i liked a lot when i was watching them uh but I still knew that it would be a huge flip, right? I mean, Madrang is very untested, and so is Comp. Uh, but I saw, because we're obviously considering a lot of different players, and I saw like a lot of talent in both Madrang and Comp when I was watching their votes, like a lot of promising things. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I knew that it could go either way, but I had confidence that we could become a very good team. In the games you were watching at Malrang, was he really playing this style? It's like psycho, just like super early ganks and yeah, I mean, crazy was, puffing. Uh, very ganking jungler. That's the first thing he told me. Like, I'm a ganking jungler. That's the first thing he told me. And this, Did you uh, want that? Because obviously it's a big difference from Inspired, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure, uh, a ganking jungler was a nice change for me because now I could be more... Like, uh, with Inspired, I was playing his game, like, for 2021. And now I could, like, go back to how uh, I want to play the game, for example. Uh, a bit more so that was a very nice change for me because i could like i feel like i can improve way more when i'm the one like trying to lead the game a bit than just following inspired for example i feel like it's hard to improve them so it was a very big motivation for me to know that i have like a lot of responsibility What's weird is in that split, I was hearing conflicting rumors, mate. Because on the one hand, I'm friends with people like Odoan, and he was telling me, like, actually, Marang's English is like a bit iffy, or it just says a few words. Then I was hearing other people like, no, his English has got really good. What I want to know is this like, when he does those crazy ganks, is he actually common that he's doing them? Does he plan the first one? How, how do those come about? I mean, th- that's the good thing about Marang that, I mean, if you're a young learner, it's sometimes just to respond to the flow of the game, like what's happening in the game. And sometimes he sees a very good play, like he sees what's happening. And uh, sometimes it's very bad. <laughs> but I think usually it's very good what he's doing. But uh, I mean, sometimes it's int, but you can't succeed with every play, right? Uh, so if, so if Larson's I mean, in lane and the lane's like, like pushed up to him and Malran comes behind, is he calling that? You just look like, oh, see, he's going in. You just have to go yeah, in. Course, it's, it? not, uh, it's not like Malran has suddenly shows up in my lane. I mean, he, he, he speaks English, he would say, yeah, I'm coming or something. All right. It's, yeah. It's not uh, an issue. 
Fair enough. Okay. So obviously this particular split was also a very interesting one because it's funny, even though in the regular split, you guys were awesome again. It's like people were just like, right, I'm not getting fooled again. I'm never picking Rogue to win again. And everyone was out on you the whole way. They basically they only allowed you to win the first series. And to be fair, the way the Fnatic series was playing out in the upper bracket was exactly what they were all saying. It was like, oh, Fnatic stomping them. Oh, they're in their heads. You know, they can't, they can't win. They're behind in the game. What happened in this series? What happened in the first two games? Uh, I think we're very bad uh, at drafting again. Uh, oh, it's easy to blame draft, and but I think coming to playoffs, drafts has sometimes been a big issue. I think, uh, and I think we drafted like uh, uh, betas, like not aggressive. We're very. Uh, uh, I, I don't. Know, I don't find the right word, but we're not. We're not drafting confidently. We're drafting very passive. Very passive. Uh, and after game two, we were like, okay, we just need to like draft more aggressive, like stop being so fucking, uh, yeah, uh, passive. Uh, what about this story? Because I saw there was an interview after this match where Comp said that, after, that in the third game, you actually just said like, don't give me victory anymore, which obviously that's like a classic Larson style champion. They were like, yeah. give me something fun. Is that true? Is that how yeah, you got I'm, Silas? Yeah, I mean, that's how I got Silas, yeah. Because uh, Silas is not a Larson champion, if people don't know. You played it, what, like once in your whole career or something bad, right? It wasn't something much. Like that, something like that, yeah, but uh, I mean, that was basically what happened. Yeah, I mean, I was very angry after these two games. I felt like we, I mean, especially like our dress were very passive. Uh, so I just wanted to play something where I could do like way more. Because uh, you play Victor two games and you lose, you're like so bored of of League of Legends. Like, what's the point of playing? So then you also play something fun so you can actually do something. And yeah, I mean, that's what happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, this was a great moment for me, honestly. It's a serious. Uh, like was there anything was... unusual about how you played the Silas in those games? Like, was that the way you would normally play? Like, were you actually, you looked like you were pretty aggressive. Were you, were you in a different mind state? What was it? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I didn't feel like I was in a too different mindset. I felt like maybe, I mean, we were on the, wait, was this upper bracket? I guess. Yeah, yeah. upper bracket. But I don't know, when you're two down, then you feel like you don't have too much to lose, I think. That probably was my mentality, but uh, I don't know. I mean, younger, my younger just came in and killed humanoids, so it was not like uh, too hard to play for me. They were, like both of, all these games were like very early snowballs. I remember because uh, my just came in and killed him, so, and from that point it was kind of easy to play. I think. Was it a big deal to win against Humanoid? Because even though I, I got this point on Twitter at the time, early in your careers, you did beat Mad Lions a bunch of times. The first years, you were all in 2020, etc. But in the years since, obviously in 2021, he was the one getting the better of you. He was the one that winning LEC. Was it a big deal to win this series against this big team? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. I want to beat Humanoid a lot after 2021. 20, uh, I also got reverse hit by him in the final. So, right, so again, reverse hit on him it was uh, very big. It was very nice. Uh, but mainly as getting reverse hit was really cool. Because... Uh, in the past years, when we got like two down or something, we would uh, be completely out of it mentally. We would be like, uh, I mean, uh, just out of it. Like it was over. Like if we went two down, it was over. Like our mentality was too weak. Like we were, it was way too weak. But co coming to this game three, uh, like all the mentalities are so strong. Uh, so I mean, that was like the most cool part about this win. Like it's coming from a team where we had like extremely weak mentality when things went wrong. To being able to reverse super fanatic in a very dominating way, like there were less free games. That was like the best best part about it, I would say. Sure. By the way, obviously now, like I said, if we did, if, if people know when the interview is taking place the, before the playoffs in the summer split, there'd be no point talking now about Humanoid. He's probably in the worst slump of his career. Everyone's flaming him. He's looking bad. He dies all the time. But I wanted actually, since we're talking about the year previously when he was good and then in the spring he was still considered a top player like what 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 is the best of humanoid when he's at his best what type of player is he uh, i mean 2021 was by far his best and it was very hard to play against him uh, especially because his support jungle were playing a lot around him and i felt like mad is playing his game like loki like we were playing inspired game right i feel like mad is playing his game they were playing so much around him with support jungle and it was very easy for him to play aggressive like this guy really wants to play aggressive as you can see uh and with Fnatic, it seems like he can't play as aggressive because uh, his support jungle is not as much around mid as in mad. That's my view on it. Uh, so definitely, I mean, he's in the prime when he can play very aggressive and his team plays around him. 
Because one thing I want to ask you about is obviously when people talk about your playing style, right? This is the reason I think, in my opinion, by the way, even though like you might be sometimes in the consideration for MVP, like, there's a reason you haven't won it yet, mate. No, it's not that you haven't had a split where you've been really good or, or your team hasn't been number one. Remember, that's normally a fact that gets people the MVP. By the way, spoiler, if you're the mid laner of the number one team in the rankings in EULCS, like history says you should be the MVP, like that's the mid lane region. So what I want to ask was this, to me, if you contrast you and at least the reputation of Humanoid, it's because that's how fans are, mate. Like, his style of play, it doesn't matter he dies sometimes. He's the pop-off player and his attitude's cool. Like, there's a lot that fans can hook into in that sense. Do you feel like you get underappreciated? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't feel like I get underappreciated. Uh, I feel like I get, uh, at least when I were winning and I play well, I get, I don't know, appreciation. But it's not something, I don't read too much online anyway. So I'm not really sure, like, what exactly what people are saying. I try to avoid, like, uh, Twitter and Reddit for most of it, because uh, I don't, it just doesn't give anything, unless you need some fake confidence if you after you win a game. But sure. It's not like uh, it's not my mentality at least that uh, yeah, I don't uh, I don't care what what they're saying. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I'm not. May, maybe I get a bit underappreciated for my playstyle. Uh, that's probably true, because I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're human and take a lot of risks, you will have like very good moments. Uh, that don't come if you don't take as much risk. So, yes. yeah, I mean, I, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, this is something I also want to ask about because to me, the re- I mean, people often did compare last year, obviously, humanoid to Caps, etc. Like, I would say the thing about those two players is they both have the dark side, though. They, have, they also have the game where they go for those players and they just int the game away and the game's lost just from them alone. The one thing I'd say about Larson is he doesn't very rarely throw the game. Like, you might have a game where you're not that best, but you don't very rarely, you just very rarely toss the game with ints, right? Yeah, uh, it rarely happens. When it happens, I'm, the thing is, when it happens, I'm very, very mad at myself, so I make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, it can happen, like, uh, sometimes. Obviously, like, it, it should happen sometimes. You're not, you, if you play to play a perfect game every game, you're not going to be a good player. Like, you need to take risks. Uh, but, uh, I mean, when it happens, I get very mad at myself, so I make sure it doesn't happen again, for a while, uh, at least. Right, obviously, I've talked to you about this previously on talk shows, but there's like a famous narrative. It was actually Veteran who came up with this. Because when, when players were coming up from ERLs to LEC, what he tried to do basically was come up with what you'd call an analogue for that player, like another person you can relate them to. So I'll give you an example. When Comp and Kazi first joined the LEC, he was like, right, well, if you've never seen these players play, Comp's more like the reckless style ADC, and then Kazi's maybe more the forgiven style ADC. And I, listen, I know the Kazi part of that's aged like ass now, but at the time, that was how people were seeing it, right? So famously, when you came in the league, in the same way as people wanted humanoid, to become caps, everyone said Larson's a bit like Froggen. Now I don't know why uh, you could take umbrage of that. Like obviously you're not direct. First of all, you're not Danish. You don't play fucking India. I mean, at, at the start, start like, I was yeah. very like Froggen. Yeah. At the start of my my career, I was uh, very like Froggen. I would say. Uh, then I tried to change it very fast in like 2020. Uh, even though summer was a lot scaling, I felt. Uh, yeah. I mean, I tried to change from pest a lot to be like a lot more aggressive. Uh, but definitely at the start, uh, well, I, I could I can see this compar- comparison a lot. I also think as well, if you think about, remember this is, it's only fans remember, think that you have to be like the Zed player who gets all the pop-off kills to be good at League of Legends. One thing I actually learned from Frog and from talking to him and from watching his game, mate, he actually taught me years ago the power of farm, which is that if you farm well, if you can consistently out-farm the other guy and you can take the right waves, or he ba- yeah, when he bases at the wrong time and you just get an extra wave, it's like eventually, dude, by the end of the game, you might have like five kills worth of gold that you sort of got for free. You didn't have to take a risk to get the kill. I remember when he said that to me, I, I started watching these games games dude and it's sure for the fan they only care about the aggressive move but like yeah, exactly. th- that's a there's a chess there's a chess aspect to the game and yeah, yeah, like, there's, there's a mind game right yeah i mean yeah i mean i see your point now that uh, like i would be a bit underappreciated with uh, playstyle uh de- but definitely i mean people i mean if they see like a 40 cs lead they're not uh, really gonna care i remember this happened to me in, like week one in this year they were like oh yeah Lars had very bad early games and in one game i had like 40 cs lead at 10 minutes and was like <laughs> Okay, yeah, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is just a show of playstyle. I mean, you need to play very disciplined. You need to make sure your team plays very disciplined if you play this playstyle. Uh, yes. That's true. Yeah, because that's obviously the downside. And spoiler, if anyone's seen Froggen's career, when he was like the good player, but the rest of the teammates were bad, it's not a very good style to win because unfortunately, it's like you're doing a good job getting little leads and building them up. But as you say, if it, if in the other lanes, people just int or the game gets taken over, like you can't do anything as one player. You're not going like 1v9 as an Oriana. Like, you know. <laughs> I mean, you can one one but not if your team is uh, yeah, not scaling with you, right? Indeed. Uh, so, yeah. 
Have you ever, by the way, do you ever, like, if you play a solo queue, if you play a random solo queue game, because you tell me you don't stream, do you play the same way in solo queue? Do you play properly? Do you ever just say, fuck it, and just go uh, crazy? I mean, I play like a Korean in solo queue, like, very aggressive. Okay. Uh, I've, I just, Is it important to practice that way, you think? Uh, Not really. Uh, I mean, it's good. You should definitely play more aggressive solo queue, right? But, uh, I don't know, I'm just limit testing. Uh, yeah, that kind of play style in solo queue. Because this is one thing that's a very weird narrative around Rogue, where because you haven't won the title yet, people always say, like, ah, who cares about, like, the best of ones? Like, they just play boring and safe, and then they win the best of ones. And then the same story in Scrims. Like, in Scrims, they're playing properly. All the other teams yeah, basically told yeah. me they f- Rogue's the best team to Scrim against. You play properly, like, how you play yeah. on stage. But the question is this, right? If you won, by the way, these narratives go away tomorrow, but because fans have yep. to come up with a reason why you didn't win, the logic goes, like you sort of try hard and too much in scrims and you should like skill check them more and you should go crazy like the Hiller Sangs of the world we're hearing about. What do you think of this narrative? Uh, th- I mean, I think it's a very bad narrative. <laughs> uh, makes, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think the reason we didn't win, like we choked in some playoffs, I think it's not like we're choking on stage, but we're choking in the way that our environment became bad in a lot of the high pressure times, like playoffs, worlds. Uh, our environment became very bad in like almost every playoff, almost every Worlds. Like even in the spring playoffs 2012, when we reached final and we were two up, we started the playoffs by getting stoned by Mad. And after that, we went against Schalke and we were 1-1. I remember there was a very big moment in that game where they were insanely close to getting Drake Soul. It's called Soul, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, got, they were insanely close to getting Drake Soul. And they were like winning the fight. But I remember I got like a four-man Syndra stun which like turned the fight and made us win and win the game. But if we lost that fight, I think we would have lost 2-1. I'm not sure if we, our mental would be strong enough in that playoffs to win against Schalke 2-1 two, two down. Uh, but this was like came, this was issues that came from like just uh, like before this series, like our environment in practice and just how we behaved when the more in like very high pressure situations came around. Because I'll just say, by the way, anyone who thinks that, like, it's a dream to play, like, <laughs> scrims with Hill Sang, all I'll tell you is I've, I've got friends where I've seen some of these scrims. Mate, I don't know what anyone's getting out of some of those scrims. It just looks like people are just diving in, like, from level yeah, one. Like, yeah. it's mental. <laughs> it's like in 2020, we would never become a good team if we play like that. We only became good because we were, like, insanely structured. So, yeah. Right. It's sure. not a bad thing. Sure. Right, by the way, we've obviously touched on it briefly before, but I want to save it because it's an interesting topic, right? People might remember. It's funny because obviously we've even got a record of this. If people go and watch like the crackdown or whatever it was last year where you came on the show, you came on before the summer split playoffs or whatever. And we had this whole discussion where I tried to sort of push you. Of, like, did you choke? Because obviously that was the whole thing. Everyone's saying they're all chokers. They're all... And you particularly, because you were, you were like an MVP candidate and didn't win. They were like, he must be a choker. Now at the time, right? Again, I think it's a bit like the Frogger thing. I can see how people can take one thing a different way or they see a different perspective. But at the time, I would agree with what you said earlier. You were sort of in denial. You were sort of like, nah, it's just a few times, or you know, it was, or it was a bad game, or we lost to whatever G two or something. Like you, you kind of didn't see that. You didn't see it as choking, right? No, I mean, I, I, as I said, like just just now, I see it as uh, when the high pressure situations come, we we just behave differently, which makes the environment goes to shit, and then you play like shit. If, like if you have a very bad environment, I think. Uh, like it's very hard to play. I think it's very important that everyone trusts each other and that everyone is on the same page. But if there's like bad environment, it often doesn't end up good. And that has been our issues, I think, in the playoffs in Worlds. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that that's it's like shocking. It's definitely shocking in a way, right? Because when the high pressure situation comes, then you behave very differently. And then uh, that translates to the, the stage games. Yes, like, I mean, put it this way. That's how I, that's how I see it. And, yeah. yeah, if people take offense like the term choking, there's different, you can call it like performance anxiety or, you know, you have moments where you can't hit your peak level. There's, there's different ways you can phrase it, obviously, but it's the same concept we're getting to. Now, one thing I'll say, I actually told people this on the shows because I didn't want them to all just give up on Rogue and be like, ah, oh, fuck Rogue, they're never going to be good. What I told people was, I told you basically, without telling you exactly what you said, I said that I'd, previ- I'd contacted you and basically you were actually one of the few players, by the way, in League, who actually seems interested in trying to actually overcome this issue. Most other people, by the way, do just are in denial forever if they choke. They just, they'll go years and years or or have performance anxiety whatever. they just think yeah. oh, I'll get, I'll, it was a bad day I'll, I'll be better next split or I'll try harder like if it's something where it's, if it's affected you if it's affected you this many times it's worth looking into stuff like looking at people who've had careers like that in sports maybe or trying to think about psychology or something right 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember. Uh, yeah, I know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, some people. I mean, include me. Okay, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> okay, I mean, I definitely at the start of my career, I was kind of choking a lot. I felt like on stage, and uh, I mean, it's definitely something I focused on for like a very long time to play like the way uh, in scrims like I do on stage. And I was re I've been especially last year. I was reading so many books about uh, how to perform, and I was watching a lot of videos like on how to. I mean, everything like uh, regarding performance, right? And how to. Yeah, being the right mindset on on stage. Uh, so they, I mean, I worked a lot on it, and now I know very well like what what I need to 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 perform. So I mean, so, yeah, you can definitely like fix these issues like, if you take do everything you can to fix them. Because I think that's actually an interesting detail. The one area I think where people maybe take it too far trying to paint a picture of who you are, is because you play in the game a little bit conservative. They also maybe think, like, you're scared or, like, ah, oh, I'm fine just losing and being second best. Like, as you said, like, you get mad at these fucking games you're losing. You get annoyed that the style doesn't work or the team doesn't have the right comp and you haven't won yet. Like, you actually want to change it to win. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think anger is, like, such a powerful uh, tool, honestly. I mean... Uh, I always become extremely angry after losses. I remember, I mean, this week we lost to SK, and I haven't been this mad in in so long time. I've, I was not sleeping that night. I was just, uh, yeah, I was very, very mad. Uh, and this, but this helps like a lot. Like when when you become mad, you can use this anger to just uh, uh, fix things, right? Like improve. And uh, yeah, it's a very powerful emotion. I think very powerful if you use it the right way. You can also use it the wrong way and let things go very bad. But uh, for sure. What about this? Because one thing I want to ask you is this. Even though earlier on you tried to like check me out, like everyone plays this here in Cork all the time. That's true. Here is the problem, though, Larson. If I look at your like top player champions, once uh -huh. I go past about five of them, it's going to drop down way lower the number of games played, mate. That's the difference. Yeah, probably, yeah. So I have a question for you, and this is I the mean, question. Of course, course I play a lot more of this, of this championship. Yeah, of course. But this is, along these lines, I have this question then, which is if if people think, right, Darf is just a fucking boring mage player, I've got a few champions I want to ask you why you don't play then. Because I'll give you an, an obvious yeah. example. Look, you yeah. played a few games this split. Obviously, now you start to work in your championship. But all those years, where was the Lissandra? I would think that would be a yeah, fucking yeah, classic. Has been for so Shouldn't long that be a classic it's... last encounter, though, or something, you know, the right oh, match or whatever been bullshit for like three years for sure yeah she's been very bad for like so long time that's not 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 an example i would say not an example people were still right. playing it in season nine season nine i played a lot uh, season nine i played a lot in spring i was like lissandra king i think you've played like five i mean you played like five times your whole career or something mate. i mean i mean in, <laughs> okay in spring split in spring split that split uh in season nine that was like lissandra's strongest point she was so insanely broken. right there was like okay. aftershock lissandra and I was playing it a lot. I was super good on it, but since then it just hasn't been good. So. Well, maybe we're getting to something here because it sounds like you just want to play a broken OP shit. Because I was going to ask about two other picks, yeah. but spoiler, I'll give you the disclaimer class. And I'm not pretending they were the best picks in the world. They're just, they're just unique picks. So the other two I want to ask about is why have I never seen you play fucking Carthus? Carthus. <laughs> you would never I'm play not... that mid. There's been times where that was a mid. Uh, I mean, season three or something, yeah. Or like... No, mid. You could play that in some of the last few seasons. I have to him. I, mean, only, I think only Frogan has played it. You never wanted to play it? No, I would think you'd be great in learning that, mate. Extremely boring, extremely boring. It is boring, true. You yeah, just take the queue all the time, that's all you do, yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, you're just AFKing. Like, the thing with Asir, okay, and like Oriana, when it was fucking strong, is that you're playing to win lane. Like, you're playing to stomp lane. Like, people see, like, Asir, Oriana, like, stuff like that, they're like, oh, yeah, they're scaling. But uh, it's not, you know, like, you, you play champs to win lane, and... That's what uh, I enjoy about these champs. Like when, when, because they're like strong the whole game. Like if you play a seer yes. and you're like winning early, winning medium, winning late game, like how, how nice is that? Uh, I think if like Cortis and like those champs, like Seraph and stuff, there is like AFKing whole early game, which is very boring. And not, okay. not, a, good, not a good place, that. Not a good place. Put it this way, I will say again, if we were talking to the fans who only care about like the Cap Sakali game or the pop off game, I would say that to them. Like those champions you're talking about, Oriana is here. There's a reason, by the way, these are always in the meta when mages are strong. Like, these are what these are the, that's the reason, mate, they call them control mages. These control the whole game if you're ahead in CS, right? You yeah, can just I control mean, the entire team fight. Same like Victor in Spring, I think it was very strong because it's like well, it's such a dominant laner. And it's like if you're winning lane and then you take over the game from there, it's like Yeah, I mean, uh, it's such a nice way to play the game, I think. Because I do think that's an aspect just historically with the champion Oriana, mate, that people have like really misunderstood. They always think it's just like a passive champion. I always tell people, mate, just go watch Rookie play that champion. He's, yeah, he's yeah, fucking yeah. so great. He's going for kills all the time. It's, he's amazing with it as well, mate. He damages the uh, fuck out of the team. Crazy, yeah. He's crazy on Oriana. Uh, yeah. 
Right, this one's a niche uh, one then. The one last playing, one. Go wait, on. playing OP champs. Yeah? I, I just blame my coach for this, honestly. Like, it, he tells you to just pick whatever's broken. But this is also like Freddy, Freddy mindset. He's very uh, focused on... Uh, like He wants structure in practice and uh, in draft. So he has kind of forced you to pick OP champ. You, you can't really do anything about it. So Okay. Well, the one other one I had then was just why have you never, ever played Velkos? Not even one game ever. <laughs> Uh, I mean, my, my, actually, my brother is a Velkos man and always tells me to play Velkos. But... I would think you would love it, dude. No, I mean, maybe it won't win lane, sure. Not that's my champs, those are not my champs. Like, the cards is Velkos and those champs are just AFK. But they've never been like pro in pro, like meta and pro anyway. So That's true. Yeah, they've never been meta. They've never been good anyway. So, yeah. Uh, but enough about Nemesis Worlds. But whatever. So, sorry, what? No, never mind. Never mind. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, he did play a game of that at Worlds, yeah. Really? He played it against top esports, believe it or not. It wasn't a great game, put that way. So that was that was really? a bad one. Oh, yeah, okay. that was actually when they were losing to get reverse swept. I've got a question okay. for you then. Actually, I just brought him up there, but nowadays no one ever talks about America. He's off in Korea. No one knows if he'll ever play again. So Nemesis, obviously, at one point in time, was ahead of you. He was in Fnatic. He was in all those finals. He was at Worlds. He was in the playoffs. He, his career was going great. Now it's detoured a little bit because he's gone away. I went to ask because he was someone else at the end of his career, I think, actually got really... Um, people had a really set narrative that he was just a super passive mid laner, right? They, th- they sort of made him sound like an even more boring version of him or something, or they thought he was just whack at the end. He was obviously a good player. Who do, who do you think Nemesis was over the years you played him? How would you describe him as a player? I mean, something happened to him, like, with the way he played the game and mentality-wise, uh, in, in, especially in, like, 2020, even, like, in spring. But, I mean, he became, like, very passive. I think, like, in 2018, 2019, when we played him, he was not that passive. He was playing, like, like he should play the game. Like he was playing aggressive enough, but something happened with his uh, mentality in 2020. I'm not sure. I mean, only he knows, uh, and maybe some more. But definitely something happened. I remember when I played against him in 2020 summer. I was watching uh, stats with my analyst, and I saw his four percentage were like four percent in like three games. Like the first super week, yeah, like four percent, four percent. That's really just, like I've never seen anything like this. What do you say there? Four percent? You mean like uh, participation or something? No, no, four percentage. Four percent. It's like if uh, when you're over. How much like, you go half, forwards? Yes, that's how much you're like over enemy, enemy half of the map, basically. Like. Oh right, I see what you mean. Right, okay. I'm not sure. I think it's called four percentage. And it was like four percent. I remember like telling my analyst, "Okay, I will just walk up to him and just fight him, and he's gonna back off." And that, that's basically what happened. So I mean, definitely something happened to him because I felt like he was. Very, very good. Like when I played him in season nine, season eight, I thought this guy was like so good mechanically. And like, but then something went wrong. Something's wrong in 2020. Obviously, since you're a mid laner and you've been playing during all these classic years of the G2s and all these squads, I've got to ask you about caps and perks, right? But over your career, when you've been able to play them, you obviously played like a little bit of perks at G2 in the first period, and then obviously you came back now in Vitality and Caps has been there the whole time. How, who have these, these two players been? Like, do these players live up to the billing? Are they at all overhyped? Are they the best? What is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, when Caps has his days, it's very hard. I mean, it's also about... Uh, I mean, playing as G2 is very hard overall because like, they play around Caps a lot. Uh, he makes the game very volatile for mid lane. And they play around him a lot. Uh, and Perks. I mean, Perks, I never played against him in like complete prime rate. Uh, I mean, now he's starting to play very well again. Uh, and playing against him in lane is also very fun because he is the type of player to abuse like in lane. Like, he, he tries to win lane very hard. Like, he, he really tries to win lane. I remember when I played in spring, I was, what the fuck, what the fuck is this guy doing? Because no one was playing this place that to like punish on like every CS, like the forgiven place that basically, where you're like, trying to punish every single CS, like try to d- deny every CS. And this uh, inspired me a lot in spring, actually, when I played against him. Because he was just trying to bully off every single CS and like trying to zone you off as much as he, like humanly possible. So, yeah, I mean, it's very, definitely fun to play against him. And, yeah. Right, as I said earlier, classically, Europe especially is known as the mid lane region. Like it's probably one of the only regions I've always said in the league in the history of league where they p- can produce players specifically at mid lane. That can be as good as the Koreans. Like we've seen it with Caps, we've seen yep. it with some of players yep. over the years. Right. So the question is this: with all the great players that I've played, at the end of your career, Larson will be among those names, right? He'll be one of the names of like the fucking the Mount Rushmore type of like there's Caps and there's put will Larson be there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean <laughs> I would be very disappointed if I'm not very disappointed. Uh, but yeah, I need to win a title, that's for sure. That's uh, the first step. Uh, do you think these players, do they all have it figured out mentally? Do you think people overrate how clutch they are or the fact they always perform? What do you think on the other players? 
Uh, I mean, that mental is like huge in all sports uh, and especially in league because it's not okay if you play football, you're using like a like you're running and like using physical things, but uh, in league, like everything is in your head basically. Uh, so it's like huge. And I think perks and McCaps are like players that have, have like very good uh, mentality going into games. Right? I mean, you can see it, they're not afraid to like be clutch and take risks. So I mean, they definitely have extremely good mentality. That's that, I think that's why they're. A big part why they're so good. One thing I've noticed about you is even if, like, you'll give a very matter of fact answer, maybe you think a player's overrated or this guy's the best one. You almost never trash talk. It seems like. Do you ever? Do you ever get the itch? Is there a reason you don't do it? Uh, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. Like, maybe I should trash talk more because it's pretty fun. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not sure. Not sure. I should probably trash talk more honestly. Like, I think it's uh, fun, but it just feels bad to like flame other people. I mean, I don't think anyone is. I don't know, there's barely anyone trash talking in EU, is it? Uh, it's true. It's true. I don't. I, I don't see ever anyone trash talking. Basically, I only see Europe in trash talking. That's basically it. Uh, but I think it would be more fun if there was a bit more trash talk. That's for sure. But since no one is doing it, it's uh, yeah, we'll get a bit BM to start doing it. Because I feel like the other reason I think you could get away with it is because like the obvious things people are going to say to you, you've done sort of like the Eminem in Eight Mile, like you, you've already called your account like Ginger God, like you, they can't say you're ginger, like it's not a fucking diss, is it? You can handle that. It's been your whole life, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like everyone is so not nice. Like, everyone, all the mailers are like so nice, like Caps, Perks, uh, Nasty, like everyone is so nice. Uh, oh, is everyone really friendly behind the scenes? I mean, I think everyone is very, like, very friendly. I mean, everyone's great guys, so it's just very wrong to trash talk anyone. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, they think they're all very good as well, so, yeah. I don't know. Right, obviously, you talked earlier about, like, the official matches at Worlds and the scrim culture and stuff. I wanted to know this. When fans talk about, especially, like, mid laners and the carry positions in Asia, obviously they do. Like, by default, some of these players are overrated because people make these guys sound like they actually are, like, gods coming down from the heavens to play with the rest of us and they can't ever, like, go below 400 APM. Like, even if it's Showmaker, even if it's Shovey, even if it's fucking Doinby, right? These players, are you, they are beatable players, right? I mean, all, all, all of them are extremely beatable. Like, I remember Screaming Knight at 2020 Worlds, and he, I thought he was, like, the most insane player ever when I uh, saw him playing online. Uh, but then Screaming Knight, I think I was like, uh, I mean, it's just another mid laner. I mean, obviously, he's very good, but I, I could, like, win against him, you know? And same, like, in Worlds, I remember I was, like, winning against Showmaker in one game pretty hard until I threw the game. Uh, but I was, like, first to see up, and I saw, like, he made, like, some very big laning errors, I remember, in this game. Like, at the start of the game, he was playing very... Uh, stupid, I would say, honestly. Like, Do you think uh, he was just disrespecting you? Yeah, I think he was disrespecting me. I think he was not thinking too much. He was just like playing because he was like, okay, it's rogue. I've beaten right. this guy many times. But definitely they do some errors. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, they, they, it's not like that that hard to play against them, I think. Uh, it's more just how, how about the play, uh, how good the players as a team, I think. Because one thing I've always found interesting about talking to players is if I watch the game and I think I know what I'm doing outside the game, one thing I can never know is what it felt to play against that player. So I've noticed that's the big divide with pros. There'll be certain times where, like famously, a player looks like, oh, it's easy to play against this guy, but maybe it doesn't feel like that in the lane. Maybe he's like, contests heavy CS or he looks like he moves well with his jungler, but you might not see that if you're outside the game. Conversely, it might look like it's really hard to play someone. Maybe it's not as hard. Who is a player where, like, they're underrated? Who's a player that people, they never give him mega praise, but he's actually a really good player to play against who do you pick oh this was very hard very hard uh but now now i need to say like a mid laner right basically i think yes but i don't know do you have any examples like i feel like all of the good miners have gotten like a lot of credit like give uh, me an example who you think uh, like we have to kick off the list who will let me think who could be there i get uh, nuke could maybe be one people don't think yeah, he's that good dev- yeah definitely nuke i would say uh, even when everyone was flaming him i was telling i remember like Talking to someone in the team, I was like, I mean, this guy is still good. Uh, I don't know why everyone's making this narrative. Because uh, it's like playing against him, I could see that he's a good player. So, I mean, I remember I was... Wait, was it... It was last year, right? I think he got a lot of flack. Yeah, yeah. Even 2020, even 2020. Yep. And I was like very confused because I was playing against him. I was like, this guy's definitely a good player. But uh, it's also... My, my perspective is, is probably like a bit deluded from... Uh, on every other... Like, fans perspective because they only see the stage games yes and i think players play different on in scrims like uh, and, and on stage often and they probably play like a lot worse on stage or something uh but uh yeah i, I would say he was definitely very underrated, underrated but people see now that he's still a good player so 
What do you think on that topic, though? Because actually, when you bring that up, like, obviously, that's a classic thing. Like, some people, famously, there's a lot of people who never made it in LEC and LCS who were, like, the scrim gods, and they were actually really... They re- people don't know. So, Joe, there are people who are amazing in scrims and never do it on stage, right? It's so yeah, bizarre. Yeah. yeah, but on the other hand, you can obviously have the other way around. Like, famously, there's people who do look like they just fucking fought it in in the scrims in the regular split, but you get them in the playoffs, and they add money, they come back, they... Cl- do you do you respect people who seem like they just fuck around until they actually compete? Do you think, uh, to be a pro, should you be at your top level? Uh, can, uh, how, uh, can you phrase it again? Like, should a pro be trying his absolute hardest every game? Is it okay if, like, if you know you're the best player, is it okay to sort of like, ah, fuck around your regular split, as long as I get it going in playoffs? Uh, I mean, it's not something that I, I would do. I mean, I also would take it, like, uh, very seriously. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's not, like, too bad of a thing, like, if you're, like, insanely good and you're stomping everyone to just uh, fuck around a little bit, like, pick pick some weird champs and... Play more guess. I don't. Know. I don't see it like. I don't. Know. I don't think it matters like what you're doing. Like if you take one percent serious or not. Uh, as long as when the important things comes around, you're like, yeah, there. Because along these lines, I do have a question, which is when people see Rogue is first in all these splits, they're winning the most games all the time, but then they don't win the title. Some people are going to ask, "Do you try too hard? Like, should you have been like, should you take, should you ramp up slowly? Yeah, I mean, should you have a break? Does it burn you out? What do you think?" Ah, uh, yeah. I mean. But uh, it's such a fine line, I think, very f- uh, fine line. And probably sometimes we took it t- uh, way too hard, yeah. Uh, I think this split is different. Uh, with, I think I think this split will be like different. I think we will spike way hard in playoffs uh, with the way things have been going in team. So, yeah, I mean, it will be fun to see how, how it goes this split. Uh, Right, every yeah. every league pro knows the problem with interviews is it doesn't matter how careful you are if they take the quote out the quote will be the thing that's remembered and everyone so for example if people don't know I would say a classic example of this this year would obviously be that upset quote where he was like I'm too good not to win or whatever like that's yeah. every, obviously if he doesn't win everyone's just going to keep saying that forever it's going to get brought up so I, when I ask you a similar question I'm going to be very careful even though it probably won't help right which is like I said about the Mount Rushmore thing when you look at your career like it has to end with Larson as a champion if not multiple time champion right that has to be yeah, the destiny I mean, and that's what I want, yeah. I want to have a still have like a long career and I want to win many titles. I mean, yeah. Uh, but uh, don't try to overthink it anyway. Like, I mean, I just need to take it step by step and do everything I can to win. <laughs> yeah, you can't do more. One thing I wonder about, by the way, is in, in my native game of CSGO, we're actually only at the phase now where we're starting to get top teams that are the international squads of all different players. It's still the period where, like, if you've got the best Danish players, you probably make a Danish team. If you've got the yeah. best Swedish players, you, yeah, that's still a thing right, in that game because obviously it's a yeah. lot about comms and stuff. What I want to ask is this. The reason why in CSGO, specifically Swedes, who were actually often the best for many, many years in Counter-Strike... Not anymore, right? Not anymore, but the reason they used to tell me basically that they wouldn't bring in foreigners, even if the foreigner might be a better player, by the way, he might be like the best player in Poland or something. The reason they didn't do it back then was they said they also wanted like the culture to all be the same, like everyone have like a similar attitude. Because yeah, yeah. like a lot, a lot of Swedish players I know, for example, don't like people to get like American style, like too hype and like screaming. They want like to be a bit, be, be a bit calmer, you know, be, be yeah, sensible, yeah. players and team, yeah. right? How does Larson manage it? Because you've been, you've had some, you've had teammates all over the place. You've had, I've, I, pretty sure I know you've had people who are rages, people who never fucking talk, people who talk but maybe the wrong language. You've had all sorts of teammates. How do you manage it? Uh, I mean, definitely, I can. I mean, uh, what what the CSGO players are doing, I think, is uh, very understandable and probably very good. Uh, it's like if you have a full team of Swedes. I mean, I, it's like the culture is probably insane. And I mean, if you have insane culture, like you play a lot better on stage, uh, like in official games. So uh, that's something that I think is very good. And uh, I mean, as uh, as I played a lot with a lot of different nationalities, it's like. Uh, yeah, I mean, Swedes are very different from uh, some other uh, countries. Uh, like Poland, people from Poland are a very different culture, I think. Uh, so it's definitely hard sometimes to, to deal with those things. Uh, so, yeah. I've got a weird question because no one's asked you this before, mate. Right, obviously, one of the weirdest things about Caps is Caps' his dad is like a permanent feature in the community. He's, like, he's always on the stage. By the way, he's, he, if people don't know, he really is like he is on the line. You know, he spans all the emojis. He's just, he's just the, the ultimate, like, goal, happy-go-lucky guy. Like, he really is waving to everyone at every stage yeah. match. Like, that really is how he's not even pretending like that. Yeah, My question is this. What are Larson's parents like? Do Larson's parents actually follow all his games? Do they, do they cheer you? Do they think you're the best? Uh, yeah, I mean, not my mom. Uh, she def- is not watching, but my dad is definitely like, extremely like involved, like very, very involved. Uh, Does he know what's uh, going on in the game? At this point, he 
He should know. Like he has been watching me for now for okay. Even, even in my early days in like the UK, like when I was fifteen, he was like watching every game. Oh, that's I think cool. He's, he's been basically been watching every game like since I started playing in like, yeah, ever since I started playing. So he's very involved and yeah, I mean even I remember on like Fridays when we play, he would like walk, walk around on the work with like a rogue uh, outfit, like rogue cap <laughs> okay. and rogue this t shirt. Okay. So he's very involved and uh, it's very funny. Yeah. Does yeah. he ever flame you if you lose? Does he criticize the team? Uh, I, uh, he doesn't flame me. Like he, he, he's very nice to me. He, he, Does he flame all the other players? Like all the juggling team, idiot. Yeah, okay, team, right, yeah. sure. But never, never his Understandable. Son. His sure, son, understandable. he would never flame his son. His son is the greatest. You're yeah. the golden child. Uh, no, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe. Now with the okay. leaker. No, I mean, no, no, I don't think so. But he enjoys uh, watching league a lot. Uh, like even when I'm not playing, like he, he would watch. The academy team who watched, in, I remember, like in, in Spring Street, he was watching the academy team. <laughs> That's because it's rogue. And he would be like, watch Worlds uh, that when we're not playing. So, yeah. Obviously, because of the history with games like Quake and Counter Strike, people obviously know Sweden, in theory, has been way ahead with internet infrastructure and esports and stuff. Did your family know anything about <laughs> esports before you became a League of Legends player? Did anyone? Uh, no, I mean, no one knows about it almost. And I mean, our infrastructure is like extremely bad. I was playing like mobile internet my whole life. Holy moly, from Sweden, why? <laughs> yeah, because we live, we live uh, on a farm. So oh, right, you're in the yeah, countryside in- or something, right. Yeah, our internet is You don't have the fiber connection, I'm guessing, then, yeah. I mean, now we have it, but I didn't have it during my whole uh, career at home. So it's was- a lot of raging uh, about lag. I was <laughs> screaming at my parents for, like, okay. lags. By the way, also, scaling, great style to play if you're lagging as well. You just get really powerful as a champion. It doesn't matter if you hit every fucking spell. You just win. That'll help. Yeah. Maybe not, maybe not. What about this then, right? I want to know, Was obviously people might know if the timeline of when you came in, like as you said, you signed with Rogue and then initially because you were doing school, you were on the academy squad, then you came to the main squad, then obviously the team's been really good since then and you did that, side. you signed for a few more years. Was there actually ever a moment where either you got like a really interesting offer or did you ever think of leaving Rogue? Was there ever like an off-season, a season where you thought, hey, I could go to that team or I could maybe go to America or something or a different LEC team, team up with some other player? Have you ever thought about it? I mean, sometimes I'll be think about it, right? I mean, I've been on a rogue for a long time, uh, but in the end, I mean, like, very happy at rogue. So, I don't know, it, it never, like, something that has been uh, too much on my mind. I've always been, like, happy at rogue, and I feel like we always had, like, very good lineups. So, uh, I mean, I'm still happy here. So, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to be here. So, yeah. <laughs> Right, obviously, it's not the old EU LCS where, like, if people don't know, there were some really great players who made very little salary. Like, the salaries used to be ridiculously low compared to NA back in the day. Nowadays, yeah. I know some of the orgs have, like, better ones. And obviously, if you're in the G2s of the world, you can get really paid, right? Are you someone who ever thinks, because obviously, this topic always comes up, like, would you go to LCS for the big money? Like, I mean, you hear about the kinds of money if people don't know. Like, Bergson gets millions to, to play for Team Liquid. It's crazy. Do you ever think about it like that? Would you I ever mean, consider it for that reason? Do you care about um, money? I mean, obviously, money is a factor. I mean, I think for almost every player, money is a factor. Like, if you would gain, like, three times the money, obviously, that's something that's uh, on your mind. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's not something like, I'm mad about. I'm like, not like, ah, oh, fuck, I need, like, this insane amount of money. Uh, it's, like, not something I could, like, I get a lot of money already. So, it's not, it's not like, um, motivation, anyway. Okay. It's not for me. Uh, I just want to win. <laughs> Right, I've got a question for you. Aside from and maybe certain metas that are lane like specific, people make it sound in league. Maybe it's just because they're always telling me frog was shit or whatever. They make it sound like just being a really good lane is like it's out of date. That's not the way you play. You're supposed to like roam like caps and get all kills in the side lanes and take over the map. Like, what do you think in the right meta with the right champions? Just being a lane is powerful, right? As mid lane. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I have won many games who is getting like a big lead mid and then taking a game over there. Uh, I mean, it's very powerful, yeah. uh, but everything depends on the meta anyway. Uh, like, do you yes, think yes, it is... you just need to adapt to the meta like a lot of times? Uh, sometimes you can play your own style if it's working, but sometimes meta is just like too too important. Since people, or at least the other roles do, people always say mid lane is supposed to be the most influential, the most important. It's in the middle of the map. Is it the is it the mid laner's job to help the map if the if the other players are dying in the other lanes? Do you think so? Or should he just do his own job and get powerful and they have to do their own job? What do you think? Uh, they should definitely do their own job, yeah. <laughs> you don't think the mid lane should roam and help with a, some sort of gang and get people going or whatever? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, you just need to, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean. <laughs> 
obviously we're talking a lot of generalities here, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's very generalization. Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, of course, you should like uh, roam at good opportunities. I mean, yeah. I think in this meta, it's not uh, as easy anymore. Uh, like tower dice and stuff. Obviously, towers are bagged right now, actually, so it's not that hard. But general, uh, like last year, it was extremely important to impact uh, like top and bot because you had TP, which was insanely broken. Uh, but now it's uh, a lot harder, I think. Uh, but actually, last year I would say it was kind of your job to influence top and bot, yeah, like uh, to make them to make them fed. Now it's way harder, but uh, with the TP nerfs. Did you do a good job? Would you say? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I always try to do what will win us the game. So. By the way, since I asked about Inspired earlier, I didn't technically ask like what the difference of losing Hans Armor was. So what I wanted to know was this. What actually? How would you describe Hansama's role within Rogue? Like, for example, some people have said in past his career, maybe he wasn't a super vocal player. He just sort of sit a bit silently. I've heard people say things like he's good in lane, but he sometimes maybe isn't as great moving around the map or whatever. How would you describe who he was as a player when you played with him? Uh, I mean, when Hans is peaking, he's like the most insane player. Like when he has one hundred percent motivation and it's like completely one hundred percent laser focused, he is completely the same player. Uh, like his learning and the way he snowballs the game. I mean, to me as a player, I, like Hans is the biggest reason I became way more comfortable with like playing early game champs because he taught me how to snowball the game. It's like before that, I was very unsure how to snowball the game, so I was just like playing scaling champs. And I was not really comfortable on like roaming early game champs. Now I'm like ever since I played with Hans and got taught how to snowball, I'm like very very comfortable to play like those champs. Uh, so he's like extremely smart and he's very vocal as well. Uh, I don't know who said he was not vocal, but I guess he was not the misfit maybe. Yeah, this was like years and years back. I mean, Hans is like insane. I think like his mentality and he really knows how to snowball a game. Like I think most of our success, uh, most of our successes was when we played through bot and Hans just snowballed the game like on its own basically. Okay. Uh, so how has it been different to have comp then? Uh, comp is not too far away from Hans in my opinion, like mentality wise, and he's also confident that he will uh, can stomp lane. So yeah, uh, they're not they're not too different. I think. Because even though, like I said, I was initially introduced as though he was going to be like some reckless style ADC. It's true. Obviously, obviously he likes to farm up and have team fights. He is an ADC and he plays fucking Aphelios. Like, that is what you do. But I have to say, I actually thought it was quite cool, by the way, dude. The, even though you didn't win the series, that voice comes on the mic check when you were in the final against G2 after the second game where he had his own line where he was like, I don't even feel like I've got to play League of Legends yet. Dude, that was actually a positive sign to me. Like, I don't want people to sort of just be like, oh, we're losing, whatever, just pick me, whatever. I want them to be like, fuck it, like, just give me some I can carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has insane mindset. Uh, might have been the most insane mindset I've ever seen from a player, like honestly, in my whole career, uh, from this guy. So, I mean, that's extremely impressive. Uh, yeah. Is he a bit of a rager? I'm just saying that because I've known a lot oh, of Greek players, no, not just for given. There's a lot of ragers. If I was a rager, I would not say he had the greatest mindset I've ever been. With. Okay. Uh, I mean, there needs to be a line, right? Uh, you should definitely like be angry, but you need to like uh, control the anger. Like, you can't let the uh, emotions like take over you, right? So I think that's a very good line of like making sure you always improve and but without like being toxic, you know. Like, yeah. Sure. But yeah. Right. One one more thing I want to know, just as a pure aside, because you're someone who came into the scene later than people like the Perks and the Caps of the world, and you've seen it all. You've been in the bottom of the league. You've been in the ERLs. You've been in the fucking playoff finals. You've been in Worlds now. Do you think one day a Western team will win Worlds? Uh, no. Ah. Uh... Uh, well, it will be a long time, I think. It will be a very long time. I think uh, right now we're in a rough spot, I feel like. Uh, I will see at worst what happens, but right now I don't feel like we... I've been, I've been more hopeful almost every year uh, than, than I am this year, I think. So, I don't know. Not, not looking too great. Not looking too great. Uh, but the, the thing is with Worlds, like... I don't know, you can always win. So, I mean, definitely it can be like a fluke and a EU team can win one year. Like, there might be one EU, one EU team that just gets like any say in flow and just gets completely in the zone and then it's like runs for a tournament and wins it all. It's not impossible, actually, but very unlikely, very unlikely. If you see the way League is right now, it seems fairly obvious that Riot wants to keep it the current uh, like objective-based game where you have to use the dragon and the herald and the dragon and the soul to basically close the game out in the Baron. Like that's that's just the way the game's set up right now. Yeah. If you could, do you like that style of League? Would you choose to go back to before where you could split push more? It was a bit more like you can give up dragons and stuff. What would you say? Uh, I think before it was definitely more fun. Uh, uh, you could be way more creative, I think, and 
Yeah, and it was just not as set in stone like how to play the game. Uh, but it's also maybe because before people were like worse as well, so it was like maybe way easier to split push because people were like a bit not as smart, maybe. Because uh, if we had the team now, obviously you're also on the rise yourself coming through good teams and getting better players. If you had this level of players you had now and it was the old meta, if you were, if you were ahead on some of these champions like Azir, you'd be split pushing, right? Uh, I don't know. Wait, you mean like in the old times? Yeah. If you were as good at back then as you are now, you'd be more aggressive in that sense, right? Uh, I mean, the speed pushing, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not for you. <laughs> I don't know. It was never like when I was in the game. I feel like I feel like this was like very early days speed pushing. Like very early days. Probably like when there was less TPs and stuff as well. Okay. I, I don't even remember. Like I think speed pushing was like kind of died like a lot uh, when I entered the scene already. Because remember, it was like a big thing and like season five and stuff. People were like, oh, split push, can't deal with it. But yeah. Do you actually out. try to scout other players, by the way? Like I know in the modern day when there's no fucking pro view anymore, like people try to watch those. Like you can actually, st- if people don't know, you can, if you catch it live, you can still watch like LPL POVs and stuff. You can yeah, still yeah. click it. Yeah. Or you can obviously watch Korean stream if you want to watch fake or something. Do you ever study people like that? Do you try and do research? Uh, yeah, a lot. I mean, I think this is the biggest way to improve. Uh, it's like how I actually, I mean, Hard, okay, with this talent hard work thing, like hard, hard work is so important. Like, I don't think I had like the most talent of anyone, but I was watching so much votes of like solo queue from like Koreans and Chinese players and watching pro views of all like the good players. And then you just copy what they're doing basically and you become good as well, kind of. Uh, Can you give us now, a few names of people you've learned from? I don't know, I mean, I don't know, it's just like all, all the top Asian players and all the top EU players, like Caps, Caps, for example. Uh, like, I don't know, it's all the top players, like, I was watching them all, and I still do it. Uh, like, now there's LPL Pro Viret, finally. It came back. It's a uh, huge uh, buff to my life, because now I can see, like, Rookie play, and Rookie is actually insane. Like, how Because you know that's one part that fans don't seem to fully get. They think it's like, well, is it different from watching the VOD? It's, like, it's a big deal to be able to see when they're clicking and what they can see I mean, vision huge, stuff, right? I mean, it's huge, yeah, it's huge. Like, I haven't been able to watch Pro Viret now for, like, whole COVID, like, almost. There's been very few Pro Viret. Yes. But now finally the LPL like let it back, so now it's like huge. I mean, I watch every pro view of every mid laner from LPL, and yeah, I try to study them. And I mean, this like improves your gameplay so much. I mean, you can still like watch the bots without the pro view and see how they play the game, like how they walk around the map, how they pressure the map. Uh, but way easier when there's pro view. Because one thing I do think, like you said earlier about how there was a game, this split, where everyone was like, oh, Larson's early game was bad. And then if you actually go look, you're like, up oh, 40 CS in 10 minutes. What, it's, it's caused one area without flaming them. Because they're not specialist players at their roles, I do think it is, I do think one area that like broadcasts and commentators have a hard time with is just pure, like, who's actually winning the lane here? Because they, they get, yeah. remember, they're getting distracted by the rest of the map. They can't remember if there was two ganks for that guy and none for the other, or if this match up slightly behind, but that's supposed to lose. Like, I think they have a hard time with that. I think that area of the game only plays seem to have a good read on yeah i mean for sure yeah. uh actually someone does it a lot freak when i watch any he really likes cs caps but the uh, rest <laughs> of the casters almost never mentions it i think yeah like very sure. rarely but also uh, i mean i guess it's hard for him to like keep control of like every lane right it's very hard uh, sure which is fine yeah because that's the reason to tie it back in, dude. I also think you actually will be a little bit underappreciated in your career. Look, the spoiler is you can you can brute force it. If you just win the championship, they have to say you're good. Like you can, they can't fuck you at that point. Like they have to give you. But the problem is, it's cause that, let's be real. If you're a fan, when you watch the highlight package, you're looking for the crazy guy, like I say, like an Akali or something jumping around yeah, a team fight. I'm no one's gonna go like, oh my god, he's up 20 CS, even though if you actually know a matchup, 20 CS could be really impressive, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I will try to do montage plays. I will try my best. Okay, but yeah, I mean it's a very fine line. It's a very fine line. I'm trying, still trying to find like the right balance between uh, playing like proper, like enough aggressive. But I think I have a good balance. Uh, but I would definitely like to uh, do some more plays for it. But yeah, um, right. Here's a weird question: If you watch Asian League of Legends, you watch the top players, right? This is obviously a pure hypothetical. It's, it's almost certainly never going to happen, right? Let's imagine for some reason. Last Rogue and LEC doesn't exist anymore, and Larson has to play for a top Asian team, and whatever you you complete the scenario, win worlds or fucking beat aliens, whatever it is, you have to. The team has to be good. Which team, assuming you could obviously speak the language, who, where should we? Which team do you want? Who do you want to replace as mid? What team would you want? Right now, or any time in history, what's a team you'd always love to have played for? What would be the best one? What, like what would make you pop the fuck off? What would make you look sick? 
<laughs> so many teams. Uh, Come on, give me one. Bro, there's so many teams. Like, how how hard is that? That's nothing, nothing like, I ever thought of. Like, uh, like, what's your preference? Do you prefer like damn one with Canyon? Do you want to go like Knight style and like fucking Tian or some of the other the cars like he used to have? Do you want to be rookie with Ning or something? Where, where would you go? What style? What type of team is your team? I don't know, cars. I think it's pretty sick. I think it's pretty sick. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I have Mario now, so <laughs> I think True. I can pop off with him anyway. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, I can pop off with Malrang, but I would love to play with Malrang. That's all. There you go. No punch and answer. Well done. You successfully yep. avoided that. Oh, whatever. Great. Right, at the end of this Great interview, answer. exactly. At the end of this interview, do you have like a final message for people or some, someone you want to thank or say hello to? Uh, probably not. I, yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. When people ask these questions, I'm never, not even never sure what to say. It's all right. But yeah, I mean, we will hopefully win the split. That's all. Hopefully we're like really good in uh, playoffs. Talk some weekend. Taka, taka. This video was supported by Kill Your Inner Loser, Travis Goff, Ahmed Haju, Matt Pognaccio Racula, Hades, Animosity, Joseph Ginsburg, Tobias Bernasconi, Bot Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Percy, Tosh, Adam Ox, Token and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? You want to ask me a question at one of my monthly AMAs? Do you want teasers to find out who the upcoming guests are? Or maybe you want to take part in one of those lengthy esports discussions with moi? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Scroluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.